everybody. Thank you for joining the PVD Horror Podcast. We have a super special guest today. We have filmmaker Alice Mayo McKay, who is an 18-year-old filmmaker from Australia. Um, you might have seen Alice's film, Sylvan, which is currently out on Shudder. Um, and hopefully you've heard about Bad Girl Boogie, which uh, we'll be talking to Alice about and finding out when that's going to be able to uh, be seen by the audiences. But um, also there's some short films we're going to cover and a bunch more. So Alice, thanks so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to start off by kind of highlighting that uh, everybody heard me correctly. 18 years old, two feature films. Uh, at least three short films that I'm aware of, probably more. Um, and you have your own company called One Manor Productions. So yeah. super accomplished at a very young age. Um, I just want to say that's like how impressive that is, but also makes me curious, like what is your ultimate future goals? Um, future goals, I just want to keep making movies and telling stories. I mean, hopefully with bigger budgets um yeah I just kind of keep on doing what I'm doing but hopefully you reach like larger audiences and you know work with bigger companies yeah and just a budget would be nice to start with but yeah <laughs> um, so uh, so that's an interesting thing to point out because um you did mention to us and uh when we we checked out Bad Girl Boogie that there's basically no budget for that film um and Josh, I know you, that was something you were curious about, right? Yeah, yeah. I have so many questions about how good that film was with absolutely no money. Uh, and I saved those to towards the end because they're like, you know, that's the what's coming, what's coming up. So the um, I can't wait to dig into those. I am so excited to talk to you. Um, the short films were amazing and your full lengths were amazing. So I was like, I was super excited to get these. So thank you for thank you for sending them. Appreciate it. Of course, thank you. Um, so Alice, one of the things that I didn't really mention, uh, but I think it's uh, part of, it's an important part of you as a filmmaker is you know you identify as uh, somebody that's in the LGBTQ plus community, correct? Yeah, correct. Right. And um, you know that's very prevalent in your filmmaking. Uh, so you're, and I think you really are an important voice for it because you're a young filmmaker and you're really highlighting so much though. Like you're, you're filmmaking so mature uh, because you have this way of like showing this harshness of reality uh, that, you know, where there's hate, bigotry, ostracizing, but also there's like these glimpses of humanity. And you also show like the power of being true to yourself and finding community. Um, super mature filmmaking how do you do this? Like, how is someone of your age able to communicate all this and have so much wisdom? Um, well, first, thank you. Um, I don't really know. Like, I guess, you know, putting those, like, elements into my film, it's like, I mean, I am trans, so it'd be kind of weird if I didn't include, you know, trans characters or, like, aspects of life that relate to that whole journey. And, you know, like, watching a lot of films now, everyone's kind of like, oh, queer joy this, queer joy that. And I'm like, yeah, I love queer joy in films, but I think it's also... You know, sometimes, especially in horror films and stuff like that, you know, it's good to see like that juxtaposition of, you know, reality, you know, you see Sovan, um Kurt gets physically bullied, but then there's also that found family and queer joy. And I think it's just like, yeah, I don't know. I just never wanted to just show like queer joy. You know, I, I think that's important in some films and rom-coms and holiday films, I guess. But um, yeah, for me telling my story, I really wanted to include a bit of, you know, not real life, just a bit of everything. And that's kind of where the yeah. perspective I'm coming from, you know, yeah. Um, without putting you on the spot or getting, oh, sorry, one second, Josh. Uh, just without putting you on the spot or getting too personal, would like the events that happen, because there, I mean, there, like we said, there's a lot of um, the ugliness of society that's highlighted in these films. Did you experience a lot of that? And was that like kind of personal retelling uh, in a way? Yeah, I think like a lot of, I mean, my main two films, Bad Girl Boogie and Sovam, a lot of that is drawn from personal and lived experience. And if not myself, definitely people close to me in my life, for sure. Okay. Uh, you know what? That's what I was going to say, Dave. The um, I, the trigger warning in the beginning of a couple of your films, I was like, oh, here we go, a trigger warning. 
And then I was telling Dave, um, it's funny, you don't you don't know it until you go through it. As a young child, I had two moms. I went to a, a religious school and I was quite bullied. Um, and it's not something that, you know, you just talk about freely because I don't even think about it now. I'm much older. Um, you know, I talk to my kids about it, but uh, it and I, I was watching this and I, I did get triggered and I was like, oh, my God, like uh, and I found myself getting really angry uh, at certain points in your films. And I was like, this is amazing. Your relay of emotions um, and the bullying that goes on uh, was absolutely tremendous. Um, and I just wanted to tell you, like, how, going through stuff like that, like, I think these films should be seen by way more people, uh, definitely way more people. So kudos to you. Kudos to you. Thank you so much. So, that really meant a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have gay members of our family and we, we try to be as open and honest with everybody as we can be, but so I'm just gonna, like, I was going to save this to the end, but it kind of already got brought up. Can you give us a synopsis of your new film, Bad Girl Boogie, like without giving away any big spoilers? Yeah, I think I can. Um, so it's about a group of queer kids, mainly focused kids. I say kids are like young adults, but um, Angel and Dario, two queer friends, they're like best friends in a small group of queer kids. Um, they're outcasts. And then there's this killer on the loose that is killing queer kids. Um, the killer is masked. Um, and I guess it's kind of been seen throughout different stages of history and is what killed, I don't think that's a spoiler, Angel's mom. And yeah, it's just about how kind of society doesn't really care about the kids that are being killed. And then Angel and Dario kind of just have to band together and kind of, you know, figure it out for themselves. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. The, uh, and you, you had said earlier, there was like no budget whatsoever. And I was yeah. like, I, but your special effects, like it was a pretty gory film in some scenes. And I was like, this, this looks good. Like if you have no money, how did you get those special effects to look so great? Um, well, we had um, a makeup artist called Adele Show and, um, and she's been on like the new Mad Max film and a couple of other like horror films like that shot in Australia. And then, um, cause she did the makeup for Howl the Werewolf last minute which is how I met her because we had someone else lined up and then like a few days before um, they pulled out. So then I did like a quick Facebook call out as you do. And then she came up and then I worked with her there and then, yeah, we got on really well. And then I sent her the script and she was keen and like, yeah, the work she did was pretty, pretty phenomenal, especially like the scene, like the hands coming out. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I'm super grateful to work with her. Yeah. Um, so you know, this, this film, it, it's interesting when you said your synopsis uh, about kind of like the way the society uh, overlooks the kids and, you know, just, I, it's so funny because I was looking at so many other different themes in this film. I kind of overlooked that, but that is such an interesting thing. Um, what kind of gave you that, that idea for that theme in there? Um, I don't know. I just think real life. Um, I don't know, I feel especially, you know, I'm sure a lot of other communities, but especially the trans community at the moment um, in America, in Australia, in London, um, a lot of places it's just kind of being overlooked, you know, by a lot of people, especially when you're in dire situations, you know, like homelessness, joblessness, like health care is being like overturned and shit like that. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know, that's kind of the main, yeah. Hey, United States did get gay marriage legal. Uh, it was a fight, but we got it. So yeah, the I actually Rhode Island was uh, the first state or one of the first states because I remember um, petitioning for it before it went federal. Right. Like watching the film right out of the gate, uh, Bill Mosley's name came up, and I was like, "Wait a minute, Bill Mosley!" And I was like, "This is pretty amazing that." you got you managed to land bill mostly it didn't look like it did look like him but good job by that um but he did a voiceover in the film and i was like this is amazing like bill mostly is now in a transgender 
film and I am absolutely blown away by that. Is there, can you tell, tell us how you managed to get Bill Mosley or is that a trade secret? I mean, it's not a trade secret. I was just on IMDb Pro and I am a massive fan. And then I just emailed his agent and we went back and forth a bit. You know, he read the synopsis and kind of the, my background bios and stuff like that. And then he was just keen to help out. And he was the loveliest person. His agent is the loveliest person. And yeah, I got to work with one of my idols for a queer horror film, which is unbelievable. So cool. Very cool. Uh, did that give you bragging rights all over Australia? I don't know. I'm not a bragger, but I mean, <laughs> myself, yeah. <laughs> we'll do the bragging for you. <laughs> Do you uh, have like a community of friends or people around you that are also big horror fans? Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the crew that I work with, uh, like especially Aaron Chapin, the DOP editor, greater everything. Um, he's a massive horror fan. We share a lot of the same tastes. And yeah, I've got a pretty good horror group. Very cool. I, I was curious with your killer, did you have any uh, influences as far as other slasher films that you kind of pulled from in order to like get the design for your killer or any of the storyline? Um, so the design was like kind of old theatrical masks, which like has like ties into the whole yes. explanation later on in the film. Um, but I don't know, inspiration just in general really was kind of like Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, which everyone seems to hate, but I love that film. Wow. <laughs> I, I wish Brandon was here right now. That's he's like a Rob Zombie uh, apologist. Like he, I mean, he always like will say those Rob Zombie Halloween fi uh, films are so underrated and unappreciated. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Dude, your I, other guys. Yeah, sorry. I, where else did you pull inspiration from um, for for the new film? I'm just curious. Um, I don't know, I'd say like a lot of Gregoraki's work in terms of like the dramatic, you know, supernatural aspects, like Mysterious Skin I love, kind of all, obviously less intense, but all that kind of film. Yeah, I don't know, I'd say like the main two directors, Gregoraki and Rob Zombie are kind of like the biggest inspirations, I'd say for this film. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. All right, Dave, go ahead, buddy. I'm yeah. sorry I said that yet. <laughs> okay, uh, so your other film, and, and let me get this correct. So. Uh, Sylvam is currently out on Shutter, uh, but that was. It sounds like, from what you were saying, Bad Girl Boogie was actually filmed before Sylvam. Is that correct? No, Bad Girl Boogie was filmed like a year after. Oh, it was exactly. filmed after. Okay, yeah. all right. I I misunderstood. Um, so Sylvam is out on Shutter, and that is your vampire movie. Um, do you want to tell our listeners who haven't checked it out so far what what that film's about? Yeah, um, it's about a young queer teenager you know with his best friend Katie living in a small town small school um he dreams of becoming a drag artist and then he becomes a vampire is kind of taken into this like trans and non-binary queer horror vampire family and they just like feed on abusers and bigots and yeah <laughs> yes they do yes they do this uh, this seemed like it was probably a fun one uh to make and to work with everyone it seems like just the general vibe of this film, while Bad Girl Boogie is more like slasher, uh, kind of dark and tense, Sylvam is kind of fun. And I mean, in a, in a weird way, I guess yeah. you would say, but it just seemed like you were just having fun with this film and um, kind of throwing in things that, like, it's, it's cool. Cause like you have a slasher film, you have a vampire film, like you're, you're kind of doing things that I assume you love. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even though like Sovam is like a lot campier and everything like that, I actually probably had more fun on Bad Girl Boogie, to be uh -huh. honest. Like everyone yeah. did. Um, yeah, no, Sovam was a fun time. It was just intense, you know, because it was the first like feature I did um, with that crew. You know, I just came out as trans a few months ago, like to everyone. So that was new. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it was really hot. It was like, I don't know, American temperatures are different, but it was like, that scene where Kurt's in like the conversion therapy camp, that was like 40 degrees. I don't know what that translates to, but it was very hot. Yeah. Yeah. Celsius to Fahrenheit. I, I could not. Yeah. Tell you, so. <laughs> no. It's 40 degrees right now. And uh, if I didn't have my heater on, I could see my breath. Yeah. So you say 40 degrees for us is cold. Yeah. 
Uh, what's it been like since that got put out on Shutter, and you know your films are just being discussed so wildly? I, I'll you know the way that I kind of found is everybody was reposting so vam on twitter so i was like i gotta check this out um but it's like word of mouth and people are talking about you and your films what's this whole thing been like i mean it's been pretty surreal because i mean like having my film like so i'm like as a shutter exclusive like every time i log on to like the shutter website and just see it i'm like yeah it's so far, it's so far out because i'm like oh i'm just like watching your episode of drag Eel, then i see like next to it so vam and i'm like that's my film you know especially like yeah it's just so incredible and seeing you know people talk about it and watch it it's just like I mean obviously when you make a film you want people to watch it but you know when I was 16 I didn't really be like oh I'm going to get this on a streaming platform you know I'm going to see people like I've got messages like from people in Europe they're doing like part of my film as like the thesis and I'm like wow that's just yeah more than I ever expected I'm just really grateful yeah that's pretty amazing that is pretty amazing how did the whole shutter thing come about um, so there was someone I was talking to in like our South Australian film corp and then they were just had the connection to Emily at Shutter and they just sent it out to her and then she was really keen and then yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. The uh Australia seems to be like a hotbed of good independent film. The uh last year stuffings came out of there. Um this year, there was a film that made the circuit in the United States called Buttons, um, made by a tattoo artist in Australia. And uh, I think it's pretty awesome. Like, can you can you just give us a hint of what this the actual like horror scene is in Australia for those of us that don't live there? Yeah, I mean, yes, I don't really know that many horror like Australians in the industry, I want to say like. I don't know we have a weird kind of like split where there's like younger filmmakers but a lot of the horror is kind of very old school in the way like it's kind of you know misogynistic a little homophobic mm. um especially like at least the bigger productions are anyway um but I mean the DOP um an editor who did who does my films Aaron he's working he did a short film called Heavy Red as part of we made a thing and I know like film works differently over there but we have like state by state funding government. So they're kind of funded by the state. Um, and yeah, he's kind of like the only other horror person I know directly who's out there making cool shit. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure there's others. It's just, yeah. Yeah, because like off the top of my mind, I'm thinking like Wolf Creek and all that is like kind yeah. of the big stuff. Which that's I what I was thinking. Like, that's exactly I what I think of when I think of it. I don't really vibe with um, and the actors had some stuff, but like, yeah, I don't know. I don't was, actually um... think- was Boar uh, in Australia? Yeah, that was Australia. So Bill Moseley was in two Australian films. Now. Yeah, I think yeah, three. I think he was in Charlie's Farm as well. Yeah. Very cool. There, there's a, there's a great, there's a great film that the guy that made Stuffing sent me, and I can't pronounce it. It's like the New Newlyber Newlyber Nymph, and it's some place in Australia, and I butcher it every time. And he, he told me, he's like, just don't ever mention the name again and we'll be okay. <laughs> the, uh, so I'm sorry to all of the Australian people that I butchered that name every time I say it, if you happen to live near Nulabur. I'm just putting that out there. Okay, thanks, Josh. <laughs> I get hate mail. Um, the, so not only do you have something on Cheddar, but your, your earlier works are really cool too. Like the serpent's nest was totally different than like, than so bam, you know what I mean? And I love the fact that you can do these different subgenres in a genre of a subgenre. Um, and is that intentional? Like, are you just looking to do different things for every film? Yeah, for sure. Like I love a different, like I love, I love watching different subgenres in horror. So I don't think I could ever just like be like, I want to make vampire films for the rest of my career. Like, I feel like that'd be pretty boring. Not to say that like vampire films aren't amazing. It's just, I'd rather like tell my stories in different, I don't know, genres, especially like a lot of it is focused in like the drama and characters as well. So I want to explore different, yeah, different aspects of the horror world. That's pretty cool. The, uh, and I, I noticed, so doing short films and full lengths are, are a little different. Do you experiment more on your short films 
to make a better full length or do you just go all out for the short film and the full length? I think we go all out. I mean, the second test was good in the way because it's like 27, 28 minutes. Mm, and I made yeah. that up for a 13 minute short film. So then it was like 13, 28, 70 something. So I feel like that was a good middle ground before I did my feature because essentially, you know, it was a heavy film to do. Because I think we shot it in four days, which was like, I mean, we did the fi- the features in like seven and eight days, but Sabbath test, I remember I was just like a hectic film to be on. Really? That's what what made it hectic. I'm just curious. I don't know. I think working, um, I think it was just like the crew and the way we like worked was a bit like different, you know, because like we're on the same page for So Vam. It was like a different DOP for Serpent's Nest. And it was just like, we know the references that we wanted, and, you know, we know how we wanted to work. And I think for Serpent's Nest, we just kind of bogged down. Um, you know, there was more people on set as well. It was just a bit of a, I don't want to say a nightmare, like, but it was intense. We call it learning processes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a learning process. The um, well, the the howl of the werewolf. Um, it, that that one really stuck out to me too. Uh, what was the process filming that short film? Because at the end of it, I literally like came off the couch and I was like, "Oh my god!" Um, can you fill us in on the, how that was to film? Yeah, I mean, so that was October last year, just like out of a lockdown, about to go into another lockdown, I want to say. Um, but yeah, I think that was like three days. And we did, because I'm a big Edward fan, um, I spoke to like um, the person who runs like the estate kind of thing. So I adapted kind of an Edward short story, it's like the same title, it's a bit more erotic and everything. But um, yeah. Um, so was, we shot it like in the winery area of South Australia. So it was like an hour drive. I mean, it was it was fun. It was also pretty hectic in terms of the setup and stuff. Like, yeah, I don't know. And especially because we had the makeup artist drop out as well. I mean, it was a blessing. Oh no! Out. Like that's how I I met Adele. But yeah, three days before the shoot was pretty not fun. <laughs> I'm then worrying about entering another COVID lockdown and then traveling an hour and then yeah, it was a lot going on. But yeah, I'm really happy with that one. Yeah, that was, that looked, it was really well done and it looked like cinematography wise looked great. It was, it was, a, and it was short and it was like short and sweet, but you, it's funny. Cause like, I, I feel like I didn't get to check out Serpent's Nest, but I saw Tooth for, was a Tooth for a Tooth and um, the Howl and like in such a short amount of time, you pack in so much story that it doesn't feel like a short film. Yeah. yeah, thank you. The uh, the other thing is um, your characterizations are really good too. Like you actually like feel for the characters all the way through. Even the guys that are like not necessarily the best of people, you still, there's some kind of bond between you and the other person. So um, how do you come up with these characterizations and get them so in depth? Um, wow, I do not know. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's like, I actually don't know. I mean, like my writing process with like my co-writer and stuff is I always like pretty much have like a character list and then write a couple pages about it and then, you know, write some scenes of narrative before we go into script. But I don't know. I just think the kinds of films that I watch inspire me are very character focused and especially because I, you know, as much as I love horror I do like you know combining those drama elements you know especially like Greg Araki's work is very character heavy and focused and all that kind of stuff so I guess yeah I don't know I just kind of write what I want to personally see in like characters and stuff like that so I I had this idea about characters and I want and I think it kind of might explain a little bit of like what Josh is asking and you know not to put words in your mouth but so it's like it's all about like identity but like a lot of it is how people have more than just one identity and i don't know if that's something like i'm assuming that would be probably something more more personal to you because um within like the being in within the lgbt community like identity is so important right um so with like your characters this idea of like there's a lot of ideas of like transforming and like 
monsters, but even within monsters, there can be different like identities. There can be monsters who aren't bad monsters. They're like more vigilante. Um, you know, there's, it's just, there's so much like dynamic and uh, layers to each one of your characters. But I think that kind of goes in line with like how we are as people. We're not just one thing. We're not just all bad. We're not just all good. We're not just, you know, we're not just our sexual identity, but we're also our other identities as well. So I think that's kind of like what you're nailing with these characters is they're not just one thing. Um, in so Vam, there's like uh, kind of like this arrogant character that he meets early on, who's actually a good guy. And I think that that, that character was interesting and kind of goes in this line because he's arrogant, but then later you kind of realize he's also um, well-intended and sometimes can be a smart ass and sometimes can be other things, but like, it's just all these different layers to your characters. Yeah, I mean, I think you pretty much said, yeah, I don't know, I think it is important. I mean, even in Sevan with like Kurt's father, who is like, you know, not the best like person, but at the same time, he wasn't the world's worst person. And I kind of wanted to show like, he was supportive and I'm not excusing any of his actions or anything like that. But at the same time, you know, that was Kurt's kind of like reality, even though for Kurt, it was a different story, but for the dad, you know, he was like trying his best in quotation marks, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, the conundrum of parenting. Like I didn't agree with my parents' parenting until I became a parent. And then I was like, you know what? They did the best they could with what they had you know like yeah 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 so but also uh, also it's tough for the child too because like all we do is like we have this idea of what a parent's supposed to be like to us and when our parent doesn't meet the you know and what that vision is then we you know we don't know how to respond to that and it sometimes it's anger sometimes it's sadness it's all over the place stuff it's all messed up Dave, Dave's a psychologist. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> he gets so deep sometimes. Oh, a little too deep. Um, Sorry. Bring it back. Anyway, uh, so back to your characterizations. The uh, another thing I noticed, you have like a lot of the same actors in your films, and I was wondering if you write parts specifically for them, um, and is it like? You know, you just get all your homies together and you're like, hey, we're making another film. Let's go. And uh, I was really curious about that. Um, yeah. So um, in So Bam, like the father role was definitely written for Brendan because, I mean, he was in Tooth for Tooth and Serpent's Nest and pretty much everything I'd done for such a long time. And I think he's really incredible. I mean, like a lot of the leads were auditioned for that one, I want to say. And then um Landon the cowboy vampire villain person that was I had him in mind for that as well and then bad girl boogie I don't know um I'd worked with Lisa the lead actress on a, a web tv show thingy um that I was just helping out on and I really loved her work and then yeah I don't know I think it's a mix of me just seeing other people and like work and then yeah combining that with people I've worked with and yeah it's just how it is and then for my third film um louis who plays like clive and bad girl boogie and the hunter in hell the werewolf who's had smaller roles i wanted to give them a larger role i'd work with them on a tv show first day as well and then i flew in a friend from sydney who's like the lead so yeah the new one has a lot of different people as well but yeah i mean i just love working with the people so yeah cool that's awesome the uh and then the, the last thing i wanted to touch on well there was actually a couple couple more things you i'm really big into camera angles and um some of your camera angles were really like unique and some of them captured everything perfectly like uh i think it was bad girl boogie there was a scene where everybody was dancing and it was hazy and i was like this is a perfect shot like and there was somebody sitting and then you could see the people dancing far like this person is spying on those people. And I was like, wow, that's that's cool. Like, that's a really good shot. Um, and I was just like wondering, did you have to study for those camera shots or did they just come naturally? Or did you try something and it didn't work and you were like, hey, let's try this. And how did you get all those unique 
shots, I guess. I think they just come naturally, especially with like Aaron as the DOP, like we're very much on the same wavelength and like love the same kind of horror films. And especially like we knew exactly what we wanted, like especially that scene. I don't know, I don't think there was any like kind of doubt in our mind. Like we knew exactly what we wanted. We knew like the colorfulness, like the haziness of the shots that we wanted. Like even though like we don't like we didn't have a lot of planning for actual shot compositions and stuff like on the day you know we like like the scene play out in rehearsal and then like this is what we're going to do because he edits them as well so it's like he also knows you know what he's going to look for in the edit as well and then just combine that with like what i visually want to accomplish and see yeah that's actually really cool like so basically you just walk in and you know what you want to see and you just make it happen and you don't you you don't even have to think about it like that is amazing. Um, you got some skill. You got some skill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forget there's a word for it, like consciously unconscious when you're just good at something. I, I don't know what it's called, but uh, yeah, they, your, your films, like even the short films, they look, they look good. They, and the stories, actually the pacing is really good. And then you have this twist in almost every short film and the full full length there's like this little twist and you're like whoa um what so here's an odd question what's your inspiration for writing a story um especially when you have a twist at the end that's a tough one i actually i don't as another one i don't know i don't know when writing we sometimes i think for so bam the beginning was very like plotted out and then I think the rest was like kind of looser and then as like so we wrote the first part and then we kind of came up with an ending and stuff and by twist and so bam are you referring to like the I don't want to give too much away the well the end scene the end scene tied together the whole movie like it was really cool that it, it was almost like Jaws like you had this definite opening where this is what I want to do and then at the end of the movie, it was boom, the same thing. It was the open and the close. Um, and Jaws is the most notable, like I'm afraid of the water. And then at the end he's swimming, he's like, I hate the water, like, and it ties together. Um, and I found that in So Bam in the beginning and then the end, you just had that perfect alignment. But um, mostly, honestly, it was the werewolf one. I was like, oh my God, the end of that really got me. And I thought that was the best. So, um, and I'm just curious, like when you write, do you actually try to put a twist in there or does it just happen? I don't think we try. I think it just happens. And like with So Bam as well, I think that like the very final scene in the film before the credits, like we wrote that and shot that like after we'd done like the initial edit of the film as well. So like that wasn't even originally going to be oh. in the film. It's just like, I wanted that that to be the end. Like I had that kind of in mind, but yeah, I don't think it's ever something we like plan to do. And uh, then in Bad Girl Boogie, it was the guy, but it was the guy from the beginning uh, yeah. without giving it away. And I was like, ooh, uh, that was well done. Was that intentional too? Or, or was that just part of the story all the way through? Um. I don't think it was like an intentional twist, but I think especially like with the subgenre of that one, you know, the mystery twists kind of were more important to kind of like who is it kind of vibes, you know, yeah. adding to that mystery and stuff like that. But that was definitely from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Um, and then I guess like the, the question before the end, um, if you had to give advice to people, what would it be? I think like in film advice or just yeah uh honestly anything the because film filming is just something you do but some people are like just go for it and other people are like you have to study and everyone has a different take um so as far as like your career in film we'll say I think I don't know I know it sounds like really stupid to just say just do it but at the same time if I hadn't like started making like really shitty short films with my friends and like doing stop motion animations like by myself with Lego and stuff like that then I wouldn't have been able to like to go on to like you know local sets and production 
options and get that experience. And, you know, ever since then, I was just like building step by step, you know, to do my very first like proper short film. And then like from that, you know, getting on more sets, more experience, and then just kind of, yeah, just building your way up. And like those experiences on sets was like something that I always reached out to, you know, like without obviously like overstepping and being annoying, but like you just kind of got to, you know, especially if you're passionate about, I think a lot of people go to film school, which is great, but it's not for everyone. And then, yeah, I think a lot of people wait for like funding bodies to come to you. But like if I hadn't made so vam, like I could have still been waiting for funding now. Um, you know, it would have been a very different film, but like I made it then, you know, it got an audience, it got a shutter exclusive. So I think, yeah, I don't know. If you're really passionate about film, I think you just gotta like immerse yourself in films. Like I watch almost like one a day at the moment and then just kind of, yeah, just really start writing, start animating, making just something to keep you going. Yeah, that's great advice. There's this theme that I, I keep seeing in your films and I wanted to just kind of get your your thoughts about it. So there's this idea of like uh, strength and overcoming in in these challenging situations. So in Bad Girl Boogie, uh, there's like, there's the experience of grief, but then they end up uh, being stronger uh, because of the grief. And then in So Vam, uh, there's the individual who's like the main protagonist has like their own sets of challenges with bullying and, you know, something and a, a much bigger event that happens uh, mid halfway through the film and then kind of finding their own strength uh, through all that. Is this something you consciously try to um, highlight and what's your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty much like a pessimist in real life, but um, with the, films I don't know I just feel like you can't just have the characters go through trauma and especially you know you know in historical times like it's the queer community you know they go through like these intense events you know and they just that it, it doesn't make them stronger they have to become stronger because it happened to them and they like find themselves together and then they find that strength you know within each other and support and stuff like that yeah awesome so Alice, can you tell our listeners um, where they can find, well, we know with Sylvam's on Shutter, um, are they able to find your short films? And when will uh, Bad Girl Boogie be released to like the wider audience? I know it's done like Salem Horror Fest, I believe. Um, I'm not sure where else, but do, could you tell our listeners that? Yeah, so the short films, I don't think are available. I think you can get Tooth for Tooth maybe in America. Okay. Um, so I think this is my favorite, but I don't know, maybe that and how the werewolf will come out at some point because I really want to share that with more people. Um, Bad Girl Boogie, we have a screening at Monster Fest in like next week and then in December, I believe as well, is about to be announced. Um, wide release, probably, I don't know, first quarter of next year, I'd like to hope so. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That's cool. No, really excited for that. I think people are going to love Bad Girl Boogie. I hope uh, so. Uh, Monster Fest, is that in Europe? It's in Melbourne, Australia, and then I think it tours around different states. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's funny because uh, I had heard about that, like, you're the third person to bring it up. And I was like, it's another guy from the UK brought it up yesterday. And I was like, well, that's weird. So <laughs> kudos to you for getting it in and getting it shown. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank the uh, Absolutely love these films. Please yes. keep it going. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for coming on, Alice. Uh, super awesome. Super awesome. Good films. Definitely check them out. And uh Thank you, guys. Yeah. Have a great night. Thank you.